said. Amen. 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 Good morning. How's everybody doing this morning? How's everybody online doing? Put it in the chat. Put it in there. Good to have you guys this morning. Good for good to see you guys this morning. We're in building. We're going to turn to the book of Exodus this morning to uh, look at what I believe the, the Lord has put on my heart for his people. And I believe that God is going to speak to us this morning as we look to a historical account of God leading his people through deliverance. So we're going to look in Exodus chapter 15. And as you turn there, this passage is going to, as I said, speak to God's people in the middle of their deliverance from Egypt. And I say in the middle because I think a lot of times we associate deliverance as like an instantaneous thing. And they were certainly led out of their bondage and slavery through a series of events. But then there's still a process that they had to go through in deliverance. If you flip over, so 15 is, has a reflection and there's a reflection of what has happened. And then if you flip to Exodus 14, you see that God led the people out of Egypt where they were oppressed by Pharaoh. God leads them to the Red Sea as they're fleeing Egypt. And as they get to the Red Sea, God parts the Red Sea so the Israelites can walk across on dry ground. And as they, the waters are let down, their enemies are swept away behind them, and God leads them into deliverance. Then comes the wilderness. And I find it interesting that as the Israelites, are rem their bondage is removed, their slavery is removed, they find themselves in the middle of the wilderness. Again, deliverance is a process. It's not an instantaneous moment where all of a sudden the slavery was gone, and then they were in the optimal state of living. God was still leading them, but they still had to go through the process of deliverance. Isn't it something that we want to be delivered from our bondage, but when we're delivered from that bondage, how many know oh, sometimes we're left to start over? We're called to build something further. How many know you could be, the bondage can be removed, but you could still maybe not be in the optimal state of how you want to be living. And so there's still a process that God wants to lead his people through. He still has work to do. Because God has a promise and God has a plan. And when we're in the middle of the plan, we have to remember that God still has a promise on the other side as that plan is unfolding. The people of God have to continue to follow God as he leads them towards that promise. Even the fact that there's a promise, that doesn't remove the requirement to trust God. Just because God has promised something doesn't mean that we don't have to trust him. In fact, deliverance proves that we need God to lead us to his promise. Oftentimes we think that just because he's, he's led us or we've gotten through something that that's the end state. But God has more for us. God has something even beyond the process of deliverance. I pray that we don't get so comfortable in our wealth that we turn back on the provider. Or the one that has led us to this point. Anyway, that's not the topic of my message this morning. That's just the setup, so let's turn to Exodus chapter 16. We're going to pick up in verse 1 of Exodus 16. The whole Israelite community set out from Elam and came to the desert of Sin, which was between Elam and Sinai, on the 15th day of the second month after they had come out of Egypt. In the desert, the whole community grumbled against Moses and Aaron. The Israelites said to them, If only we had died by the Lord's hand in Egypt. There we sat around pots of meat and ate all the food we wanted. But you have brought us out into, desert, into the desert to starve this entire assembly to death. Then the Lord said to Moses, I will rain down bread from heaven for you. 
The people will go out each day and gather enough for that day. In this way, I will test them and see whether they will follow my instructions. On the sixth day, they are to prepare what they bring in, and that is to be twice as much as they gather in the other days. So Moses and Aaron said to the Israelites, In the evening you will know that the Lord... In the evening you will know that the Lord has has brought you out of Egypt and in the morning you will see the glory of the Lord because he has heard your grumbling against him. Who are we that you should grumble against us? Moses said, you will know that this is the Lord when he gives you meat to eat in the evening and all the bread you want in the morning because he has heard your grumbling against him. Who are we? You are not grumbling against us, but against the Lord. Then Moses told Aaron, say to the Israelite community, come before the Lord, for he has heard your grumbling. While Aaron was speaking to the whole Israelite community, they looked toward the desert, and there was the glory of the Lord appearing in the cloud. If you had to title my thoughts this morning, The title I came up with for this passage was The Grumble in the Desert. Who are we? You are not grumbling against us, but you are grumbling against the Lord. And I was reflecting on this passage and I was hearing their grumbling. They're grumbling against God, they're grumbling against the leadership, and they're grumbling because of their situation. Grumbling, grumbling, grumbling. And you know, I hear a lot of grumbling. And in fact, I find myself grumbling myself. I even grumble about the grumbling. I complain about the complaining. I complain about the things I want to complain about, but then I complain about people complaining about what they want to complain about. Because it's not what I want to complain about. So I grumble, I grumble, I grumble. Grumbling about the situation. Grumbling about what we face. Grumbling about what we're going through. But is it not the same God that parted the Red Sea? Is he not the same God that rains down food in the wilderness? Is he not the same God that has provided over and over again Is he not the same God who has led us to where we are and has a plan to prove himself again? It's like they thought that God had thought through all the details to part the Red Sea but forgot about food on the other side. He thought about everything through the whole process from calling Moses to be the leader to all the plagues and all the situations that happened as as God hardened Pharaoh's heart and all the details and then they get to the sea and he parts the sea and he finds a way to make a way through the sea, not around the sea, not not just moving them through through the deliverance through the Red Sea, gets to the other side and oh, I forgot about food. Man, all those other details, I had a lot to think about. But don't we do that? We like get to a situation and we're like, God, you've been faithful for all this stuff. But what about this right now? What about what I'm going through right now? What about this situation or that situation? Or this didn't work out the way I wanted it to. Or this isn't how I thought it would be on the other side. Or maybe we're still going through the process of deliverance. And God's still working. And God's still leading. Because he still has a plan. But nevertheless, God hears their grumbling. Thank God we have a God that hears our grumbling. I don't know about you, but I will, if I were God, I would have a little less tolerance for the grumbling. Oh, you want to grumble about that? Okay. Fine, go back. It's fine. Thank God I'm not God. And thank God we have a God that listens to our grumbling, has a tolerance for our grumbling. Because, you know, we all get stuck in the grumbling stage. And here they are, grumbling in the desert. Verse 3, it says, The Israelites said to them, If only we had died at the Lord's hand in Egypt, because there we sat around with pots of meat and ate all the food we wanted. 
But you have brought us to the desert to starve this entire assembly to death. Maybe a little dramatic, but remember when we were in slavery, at least we had food. Remember when we were in bondage, but we ate everything. Don't worry about the manual labor. We're not talking about that right now. Don't worry the fact that they had complete control of our freedom. We're not talking about that right now. What about the food? We had all the food we wanted, but here we are. If only we were in slavery. If only we had died at the Lord's hand in Egypt. Huh. So what we're saying is we'd rather be dead and comfortable. It's easy to look back on that and suggest, but aren't, isn't that us? We'd rather be dead in our trespasses. We'd rather be dead in our sin and comfortable than living in the the power of Christ, where we're delivered from our sins. Because, yeah, it's, it's difficult. And life gives us difficulty. But we'd rather be dead and comfortable. You know, we, we talk a lot about a lot, and you're seeing it a lot. There's a lot of messaging about, you know, getting back to normal. We've got to get back to normal. There's a path back to normal. Man, when are things going to get back to normal? find myself saying that all the time about one thing or another. It's like, man, once this gets back to normal, in particular, this situation or this thing or this thing that I want to do. But isn't it funny that in like 2019, some of us hated our normal? It's amazing how a whole year goes by. And that which we hated felt good. Or seems like it felt good. Some people are glad that they were able to go through a season and not have to deal with certain challenges that they faced previous to the challenges that they face today. But somehow we want to go back to normal. And you know, it's funny that you reflect on that and it's been a significant amount of time since the pandemic all started here. This scripture says that it was the 15th day of the second month, so if my math's correct, that's a month and a half from parting the Red Sea, and we're already wanting to go back to slavery? But the thing is that people don't really want normal, because what is that? Normal's not really a thing. Like, normal's all relative to, like, your situation. So people don't want normal. People want comfortable We don't want normal. We want to be comfortable. The point wasn't to go back to slavery. The point was go back to comfort because this is more uncomfortable. At least we think it is because we're going through it right now. We don't want normal. We want comfortable. We want the pots of meat sitting around eating everything we want. Why? Because the situation that they faced at that moment was about me. But in all reality, this was just an excuse to go back to all the things that made them comfortable. Being led through the wilderness, even though there was a promise on the other side, how many know that wears thin when you're not seeing it? They wanted back to comfortable. You know, what it really breaks down to is when we have fear, we look for familiar. You ever scare an animal in the woods? It goes back the way it came. Or it runs down a trail it's been down before. It goes a direction that it's familiar with. Why? Because when we're scared, we resort to familiar. When we have fear or we, don't, we have uncertainty in front of us, we want to go back to familiar. Even if familiar is difficult, and even if familiar doesn't have what we need, we want to go back because it makes us comfortable. The Israelites wanted familiar. They wanted comfortable. They wanted something a little normal. It's funny that we strive for normal because normal's backwards. When we think about going back to normal or go back to something comfortable or running to something that's familiar, oftentimes that's us going backwards. But we serve a God that leads us forwards. A God that takes us from glory to glory. 
into new life, a God that renews us, makes a right spirit in us, changes us, transforms us, and has us step out into something new. But we return to the same garbage because it's our garbage. We look for the mess because it's our mess, and we're comfortable in that mess. Grumbling, grumbling, and grumbling all the way back to normal. The other thing I think we talk a lot now is the new normal, right? So what's, what's the new normal going to be? And, you know, there's some struggle with that word, the new normal. And they're grumbling to the leaders, Moses and Aaron, in this scripture. They're grumbling. You have brought us here to die. You're going to starve the whole assembly. It's almost like they're challenging the plan, right? They're challenging, like, what's the plan? What is it going to be? What is this going to look like? We ask, what's the new normal? What's going to be this? When Are we going to ever do this again? Are we ever going to do that again? Or is it always going to be like this? Are we always going to have this aspect of it? Is everything going to change? And nobody knows. But we like to predict it. And we like to overreact. Isn't it amazing how we, in this world, overreact to current events? Yes, there's some changes and there's some things that we have to make in a moment's instance, but we overreact saying it's all going to be this way forever. It's all going to be this way. It's all going to be that way and try to make predictions and overreactions. And in all reality, nobody really knows what it's going to look like. But God doesn't overreact. God has a plan. God has a way. And God has a promise to stand on. There's no overreaction with God. And ultimately, any prediction and overreaction leaves us vulnerable to manipulation. If you think about it, as you predict, you look for things that affirm your prediction. As you look and overreact to things, you can often be led a direction that you ought not go. There's an enemy out there that specializes in deception and manipulation. Dividing and conquering. Would love to get us speculating and reacting and choosing to make this knee-jerk reaction and this thing, even on things that may not be reality. Leaves us vulnerable. But my point isn't to struggle with the term normal. I believe God is calling us to be leaders that would choose what normal will be for our lives. A life focused on God, trusting the provider for provision. Trusting the God who parts seas and rains down food from heaven. And less grumbling about where we are, but a bigger realization of who we are. God's people who will follow Him. The God that restores and the God that delivers. Even if that deliverance is through the wilderness. Let's make following Jesus wholeheartedly our normal. Because when it comes down to it, while we're making predictions and overreactions, what we're really doing is comparing and contrasting, which is a way to critically think, right? You look at something and you say, does this line up with this? And contrast things and compare things. But how many know when it comes to trying to figure out normal, comparing and contrasting doesn't do us very good? Because oftentimes we start comparing and contrasting to things that are contrary to what God is calling us to do. If I make a comparison to someone else, how many know I'm making a comparison to something that's not Jesus? And oftentimes chasing a comparison that's leading me further down a rabbit hole that I don't need to go. So we chase someone else's normal or our expectation of what normal should be or what we think it should be. And how many know there's nothing normal about life in Jesus? Life in Jesus is the dead coming out of the grave. Life in Jesus is the blind having sight. That's not normal to this world. 
So why do we want to be normal when normal's not enough? Grumbling is normal. Fighting the wrong battles is normal. Arguing and bickering our way to destruction is normal. Sin is normal. But we are called to more. And normal is not enough. You see, while Aaron is speaking, in verse 10 it says, while Aaron is speaking, the whole Israelite community looked and they looked toward the desert and there was the glory of the Lord appearing before them in a cloud. That's not normal. God's glory manifest in a cloud leading them through the wilderness is not normal. But that's the God that we serve. The God who reveals His glory and leads us through deliverance. When we try to be like others, and we try to fit in, and we try to follow the crowd, and our lives look like others' expectations, how many know we're walking a different direction? And maybe even our own expectations. How many know when we make those predictions, and we make these thoughts, and we do this all the time because we have to try to anticipate the next move, right? We have to make the next step, and we have to make decisions. And so what we do is we start formulating what's it going to look like in a couple months, and what's this going to look like? And I'm not suggesting that we can't do that, but we always constantly are trying to meet our own expectations. How many know we have to submit to the direction of the Lord? We have to allow God to change our expectations and lead us and guide us and call us and reveal His glory to us. When we are fixed on others, our own expectations, how many know we will miss the glory, of the, God, the glory of God in our lives? We need to look up to where our help comes from. The Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. We miss who God's calling to be if we're not looking up to Him and we're looking all around us at all the things that we're trying to compare our lives to. Who wants to fit into a broken down weak and hurting world anyway when we can be the light in the darkness we can be different and we can be the ones that follow god through the wilderness to lay the foundations for generations to see the promise of god and rely on the promise of god why because he reveals his glory to us we're not called to a worldly normal but we're called to reflect the glory of god to see the glory of god working for us Reflect that glory through us and God for us, with us, and in us. Maybe it's just me, but it was kind of amazing at the beginning of the pandemic to see people who thought prayer was weird turn to prayer. But now as we start to put our lives back together, we tend to return to comfortable. Are we leaving out the cornerstone of our foundation? Are we missing the connection to the one who brings us into new life? Are we missing the direction and the glory of God that would lead us past what's just normal and into something that's extraordinary? God is making a way. And the bottom line is, when God makes a way, We have to choose to obey. We have to choose to obey. If the Israelites would have learned this in Exodus 14, it would have saved them a lot of grumbling. A lot of breath and a lot of grumbling. You know, with grumbling comes strife. It would have saved them a lot of strife. In fact, in Exodus chapter 14, 15 to 16, the Lord said to Moses, Why are you crying out to me? Tell the Israelites to move on. Raise your staff, stretch out your hand over the sea to divide the water so that the Israelites can go through the sea on dry ground. I find it interesting that in the moment of deliverance, God says to Moses, why are you crying out to me? Tell them to move on. I am making a way, step out into it. I am leading you, step out into it. When God makes a way, choose to step into that. Choose to obey his direction. Choose to follow his leading. When God makes a way, move on. Step out 
in that faith on God's direction. Don't look back to the old normal. Don't try to compare to someone else's idea of what it could be or what it should be. Step out into resurrection life. Yes, there may be a wilderness on the other side, but the same God that parted that sea is going to lead you through that wilderness. The same God that leads you through that wilderness has a promise for you on the other side. And yes, the wilderness is dry, and it's really salty, and your grumbling's even more salty, and you're getting at each other's nerves, but God will lead you. Yes, there are challenges at every turn, and there's other camps out there, and there's other people out there that you may have to struggle with, but God is leading you to a promised land and our God makes a way I want to close with Philippians chapter 3 verse 17 to 14 and Paul writes this but whatever were gains to me I now consider a loss for the sake of Christ What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them as garbage, that I may have gained Christ and be found in Him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, a righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. I want to know Christ, yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow attaining to the resurrection of the dead. Isn't it something when we will count that which used to be a gain a loss and say, God, no matter what it is, that's all garbage. I don't need to go back to that. I don't need any part of that. I'm stepping out in faith on what you have for me, a, a, res, a righteousness that is on the basis of faith, faith in Jesus Christ. That means that he is leading us and guiding us, and we will believe in that and follow that and allow that to change us, allow that to go through the wilderness. Because notice something about that scripture. God said that he was testing them as he provided to them. He was providing for them, but he was also making a way for them to be prepared for the promise that he had for them. He was testing them that they would only gather up the food that they need. Testing them and preparing them so that they wouldn't squander their promise when it was fulfilled. God is training us in righteousness. And on the basis of that faith, we have to trust him and allow him to prove us and prune us and change us and make us into the way that we can receive his power. And that may mean we participate in some sufferings and go through some difficulties but we can stand firm that we will know Christ and the power of his resurrection will be in us. He continues and says, not that I have already attained all of this or already achieved my goal, but I press on for that which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself, yes, taken hold of, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining straining towards what is ahead. I press on towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. We're not already made it. We're not already perfect. We haven't instantaneously been delivered. But God is working inside us and we press on through the wilderness. We press on through the challenges because God has called us to glory through Christ Jesus. And normal isn't enough for us because the glory of God can be manifest in our lives and lead us through our difficulties. Let's bow our heads. God, we pray right now that you would show us your glory. That is in the scripture in Exodus 16, even in moments where we face difficulty and grumbling and and dealing with the struggles of situations around us, God, that you would manifest your glory in our lives to lead us through our wilderness. God, we know there will be challenges. 
We know this world brings trouble, God. But you have overcome the world. And you have a promise for us that you never leave us or forsake us. But you are with us always. And so we choose today to trust in you. Right where you are, make that declaration to God this morning. I will trust in you. I will trust that no matter what I'm going through, I can rely on you. I can look towards your glory. You proved yourself faithful before and you're going to do it again. You have proved yourself faithful and you have parted seas and you have provided food and you have led us to where we are. And so today we choose that we will move forward in your power, chasing your glory, pressing on towards what you have ahead of us and not looking back to the things of this world or the things that are behind us. And God, this morning we just pray right now that your anointing would flow that you would be the one to stir up by the power of your Holy Spirit. Give us discernment of the steps to take, that we wouldn't grumble in our difficulty, but we would be reliant and trusting on you. And even when we grumble, God, I know that you hear our grumbling and you are still providing, God. But let us remain fixed and focused on you. It is your glory and your mercies that are new every day that we choose to rely on and count on because we know that in the morning we will see your faithfulness and in the evening we will see your faithfulness and as we move forward from glory to glory, God, you will take us and lead us forward by the power of your might. We love you, Lord. Let's just take a moment and worship him.